Did you know that when Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis passed away in 1994, one of the former first lady's close relatives was completely cut out of her will? Who was it? Keep watching to find out. Former First Lady Jackie Kennedy was widowed after her husband, President John F. Kennedy, was assassinated in Dallas, Texas on November 22, 1963. They had been married for a decade. The two first met at a party in Washington, D.C. in 1952. Then, in 1953, the couple wed in Newport, Rhode Island. The Kennedys would have four children in their marriage, and they suffered a lot of loss. The birth of their first child, reportedly nicknamed Arabella, in 1956 was a stillbirth. In 1957, they welcomed another daughter named Caroline. Afterward, the couple's first son, JFK Jr., was born in 1960. The Kennedys would also welcome a second son they named Patrick in 1963, but he didn't live past two days, says First Ladies. The newborn's death happened in August 1963, just three months before his father's assassination. After JFK's death, Jackie would become Jackie Kennedy Onassis. When she married Greek businessman Aristotle Onassis in 1968, the marriage was a shock for many Americans who felt like the former first lady was moving on too soon. Yet the couple stayed married up until Aristotle Onassis' death in 1975. The twice-widowed Kennedy Onassis would outlive her last husband by 19 years before her own death on May 19, 1994, of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now she's in God's hands. Uh, there's been an enormous outpouring of good wishes. Jackie Kennedy Onassis was survived by her two living children, Caroline and John Jr., and three grandchildren. She never remarried after Onassis died, but at the time of her death, she was partnered with Maurice Templesman. She would die in the New York City apartment she shared with him. A month after her death, her last will and testament was revealed, according to the Washington Post. In her will, she named Templesman as the executor and left him a Greek statue. The apartment they lived in together was left for Kennedy Onassis's two children. They also received half a million dollars, evenly split with $250,000 for each. Along with the money, Caroline and John Jr. were also granted the principal funds from a trust their father created. All the furniture and other belongings in her apartment, as well as two properties in Martha's Vineyard, were left to the Kennedy children. Yet, one of the standout requirements of the will was also left to them. The children were given some of their mother's personal documents, with special instructions stating they would never be made public. Kennedy Onassis didn't leave her young sister, Lee Radswell, anything but did grant her niece and nephew income from a $1 million trust, per the Washington Post. It's unclear why Radswell was left out of the will, but one could assume that it has to do with the possibility that the sisters were not on good terms. Before Aristotle Onassis married Kennedy, he was purportedly dating the younger sister first. When the news of their engagement broke, Radswell was devastated and though she supported the pair, the coupling reportedly fractured their sisterhood, according to Vanity Fair. Other inheritors named in the will were close friends Nancy Tuckerman and Rachel Mellon, who also received a quarter million dollars in two paintings, respectively. The remainder of the money left was directed to be placed in a charitable trust to be accessed by Jackie's three grandchildren, Rose, Tatiana, and John Slosberg, all of whom were from her daughter, Caroline Kennedy Slosberg. Jackie Kennedy Onassis' stepbrother, Hugh Auchinklaus III, would inherit the family's Hammersmith Farm in Newport, Rhode Island, per the Washington Post. Her mother, Janet Lee Bouvier, left it to her, but the farm was actually in the Auchinklaus family for generations. Because of Bouvier's marriage to Hugh D. Auchinklaus Jr., she inherited the land when he died and left it to her oldest daughter. The farm was where the Kennedys got married in 1953. Both Kennedy Onassis and Auchincloss III grew up in the home, and though she had other step-siblings, the two were very close. He was living in the home at the time of his death, also of lymphoma, in 2015, according to the Associated Press. When Kennedy Onassis died, her estate was estimated to be worth $43 million, per an estimate by the estate's executors. What did Robert F. Kennedy ask the people around him right after being shot? Why was his assassin conflicted? And what do conspiracy theorists have to say? Keep watching find out. In 1968, Kennedy, a senator and former attorney general, was the frontrunner for the Democratic nomination to the presidency. 
Ms. Kennedy, an outspoken critic of the Vietnam War and supporter of civil rights, was seen by many as a unifying force in the left wing of the Democratic Party in the wake of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. several weeks earlier. To tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. Let us dedicate ourselves to that. On June 4th, Kennedy had won primaries in five out of six early states, including the Delegate Rich Prize of California. He gave a victory speech at Los Angeles' Ambassador Hotel and was heading back through the hotel kitchen shortly after midnight on June 5th, when the Palestinian immigrant Sirhan Sirhan reportedly ambushed the senator and shot him, wounding Kennedy and five of the bystanders. Ladies and gentlemen, we've kept the air on because we've heard an alarming report that Robert Kennedy was shot. There was no video of the actual attack. The historic records instead include a handful of photos, the accounts of onlookers, audio of the attack taken by a freelance reporter, and Kennedy's autopsy. In eyewitness accounts of the attack, Sirhan approached Kennedy head-on and fired a couple of shots before being restrained by the crowd, some of whom managed to grab Sirhan in the chaos, according to the Washington Post. Sirhan continued to shoot wildly, injuring five others in the room before witnesses grabbed the 22 caliber revolver from his hand. According to witnesses, Kennedy immediately asked if everyone was okay and remained at least semi-conscious in the aftermath, even as he was put on a stretcher. Witnesses said that Sirhan never got closer than 18 inches away from the candidates, according to the Boston Globe. But an expert interviewed by the paper also points out that before shooting Kennedy, Sirhan shot a member of his entourage, Paul Schrade, whose collapse might have pushed the senator closer to the shooter. Years later, in a 1989 interview with Inside Edition, Sirhan said he shot Kennedy because he felt betrayed by the politician after he suggested during his presidential campaign that he may send 50 fighter jets to aid Israel in their fight against the Palestinians. Here's what Sirhan's former boss told ABC. He burst out in a temper. He said, that man is killing my people. He said he should be dead. Sirhan said his goal was only to save his own people, not to harm Kennedy, whom he admired. To me, he was my hero. He was my champion. He was the protector and the defender of the downtrodden. In 2018, half a century after the assassination, the Journal of Neurosurgery published a medical analysis of the medical care that Kennedy received in the hours between his attack and his death. Five doctors who had been in the ballroom where Kennedy had given his victory speech were called to the senator's side. One physician noted that his heartbeat had slowed to 50 to 60 beats per minute and that his left eye was closed. Despite this condition, Kennedy was still able to move his limbs. As the senator slowly slipped into unconsciousness, another doctor noted that his blood was clotting around the bullet hole in his head. Assuming that the clot was causing blood to pool in his brain, the doctor slipped his finger into the wound, resuming the blood flow and returning Kennedy to consciousness. Meanwhile, the hotel's switchboard operator called 911 and told the dispatcher that Kennedy had been injured, but the emergency responder didn't know the extent of the injuries and directed the ambulance to a smaller facility. The Central Receiving Hospital, instead of the larger and better equipped Good Samaritan Hospital. According to UPI, as Kennedy was being put on a stretcher, his last words may have been, please don't lift me. By the time Kennedy arrived at the hospital, he was unconscious and not breathing, according to the Journal of Neurosurgery. The doctors at Central Receiving stabilized Kennedy and restored his breathing, but soon realized he needed treatment at Good Samaritan Hospital instead. The mistake meant that Kennedy didn't arrive at the second hospital until 1 a.m., about 45 minutes after the shooting. He was immediately given a tracheostomy, followed by a whole blood transplant, and was scheduled for brain surgery, which he entered at 3.10 a.m. Over nearly the next four hours, surgeons removed as many bone and bullet fragments as they could while controlling the bleeding. Though this resulted in improved motor response to pain, his left side remained paralyzed. It became clear that in the unlikely event that Kennedy survived, the damage to his brain would be extensive. Though Kennedy remained in stable condition through much of June 5th, by 6 p.m. that day, his vitals began to slip. According to Newsweek, he was pronounced dead at 1.44 a.m. on June 6th. The autopsy was conducted by Los Angeles County Chief Medical Examiner Thomas Noguchi. In his lengthy career, Noguchi would perform autopsies on celebrities including Marilyn Monroe, Sharon Tate, and Janis Joplin, among others. According to the New York Times, Noguchi was also sometimes criticized for his dishy comments about celebrities to the media, and while Kennedy was in the hospital, he reportedly danced with joy, according to UPI, saying, I'm going to be famous. I hope he dies. That said, the Journal of Neurosurgery notes that Noguchi's autopsy of Kennedy has a stellar reputation. It's been dubbed, in fact, the perfect autopsy. The autopsy revealed that three bullets wounded the senator. 
The first bullet entered behind his right ear. This would end up being the fatal shot, and Noguchi determined it had been fired within three inches of the head due to the presence of gunpowder burns on the skin. Two other bullets entered Kennedy's right shoulder region, also from behind. These injuries, however, were comparatively minor. Interestingly, Kennedy's autopsy contradicted the reports of witnesses in a number of ways and is the primary source of many ongoing conspiracy theories about the assassination. All three shots were from behind Kennedy, and the fatal shot was fired with the muzzle of the gun nearly touching Kennedy's head. Since Sirhan approached Kennedy head-on and was reportedly stopped more than a foot away from Kennedy, this has sometimes been seen as the strongest evidence that there was a second shooter that day, as some witnesses have claimed. There is, however, a simpler explanation for why the shots came from behind Kennedy. Before the shooting, the senator had turned to his left to shake a busboy's hand. When Sirhan lunged at Kennedy, he may have ducked further in self-defense, exposing his back to the assassin. Journalist Dan Moldea, who wrote a book on the assassination, told the Boston Globe, The conspiracy people will have you believe that Kennedy is standing there putting his chest out. If you see someone running at you shouting, you son of a bitch, he's got a gun in his hand, what are you going to do? You're going to turn defensively. Former First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis remains one of the most iconic figures in history. She's basically as close to American royalty as you can get. But despite her legacy, her life was filled with complications and loss. And not just the ones everyone knows. This is her tragic story. Born to socialite Janet Lee and stockbroker John Blackjack Bouvier III on July 28, 1929, Jacqueline Jackie Bouvier grew up in New York City, spending her summers on her family's country estate on Long Island. An intelligent and talented young girl, her childhood was unfortunately riddled with family drama. Her father was notorious for being a gambling, womanizing alcoholic. His gambling habits resulted in him being expelled from prep school and even losing all of his money during his honeymoon with Lee. His womanizing ways never stopped with marriage, and he quickly attained a reputation for cheating on his wife. In 1936, the couple separated, prompting the press to publish the details of all of Bouvier's affairs. By 1940, Janet Lee and John Bouvier divorced, leaving Jackie Bouvier with two parents who hated each other. Despite his vices, though, Jackie and her sister, Lee, both adored their father. In an interview with T Magazine, Lee said, One thing which infuriates me is how he's always labeled the drunk black prince. He was never drunk with me. Perhaps his alcoholic reputation came from the infamous story of how, at Jacqueline's wedding to JFK, he was too drunk to walk her down the aisle. According to Lee, though, it was a result of her parents' feud, with John drinking from, quote, misery and loneliness after Janet blocked him from attending a family dinner the night before. The Kennedys can arguably be considered one of the most iconic couples in history. Wildly famous public figures of their time, the popularity also meant that their private lives weren't so private. Their marriage was known to have been a tumultuous one, complicated by an assortment of issues. Notoriously, John F. Kennedy was rumored to have had countless affairs and has been linked to some notable figures, such as Marilyn Monroe, Marlena Dietrich, Blaze Starr, and various other stars. There were also arguments over Jackie Kennedy's lavish spending and clothing bills. Apparently, things got to the point where Jackie's father-in-law, Joseph Kennedy, had to offer her $1 million to stay in the marriage, which she reportedly accepted. A key element of their marriage that drained Jackie, though, was her husband's political ambitions. An immensely private person, she somehow ended up marrying a man who loved the spotlight and was determined to become president. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. But even though Jackie disliked the White House and the fact that she had to raise her kids in the eye of the public, she conquered the challenges with style. When JFK was a senator, Jackie's remoteness and snooty attitude were considered a liability to his campaign. As First Lady, though, she became one of the nation's greatest assets, charming other parties on various diplomatic trips with the president. Jackie Kennedy did not have it easy with her pregnancies. She married John F. Kennedy in 1953, and about two years later, the couple was expecting their first child. Sadly, Jackie's first pregnancy in 1955 ended in a difficult miscarriage after just three months. With Jackie learning from the experience that carrying and delivering a child would always be difficult for her. Months later, she became pregnant again, but tragically, that one wouldn't end well either. A month before her due date, 
Jackie woke up on the morning of August 23, 1956, screaming for her mom. She had lost a lot of blood and later ended up giving birth to a stillborn baby. Apparently, her husband's initial reaction to the incident exposed his inconsiderate side. JFK was sailing around the Mediterranean on a yacht with a bunch of friends when his wife suffered from hemorrhaging and the stillbirth of their child. Rather than rushing back to be by his wife's side as soon as he heard the news, it took a few words from his friends to make him realize how bad his absence would look to the public. George Smathers is reported to have told the then-senator, You better haul your butt back to your wife if you ever want to run for president. After two difficult pregnancies, Jackie Kennedy's third thankfully finished with her successfully giving birth to a healthy baby girl named Caroline in November 1957. Three years later, on November 25, 1960, the Kennedys welcomed their son, John F. Kennedy Jr., who, despite being born three weeks early and having some initial respiratory issues, would grow up healthy. However, Jackie's fifth and final pregnancy would once again prove tragic. Once again, she went into labor early, five and a half weeks to be exact. After being flown in by helicopter to the hospital at Otis Air Force Base, Jackie gave birth to a tiny, barely 4.5-pound baby boy named Patrick. Unfortunately, the newborn was struggling with Heinlein membrane disease and had a lot of difficulty breathing. The Kennedys, along with the nation, anxiously waited for his condition to improve, with the Boston Globe even running the headline, He's a Kennedy! He'll make it! Sadly, efforts at saving Patrick proved unsuccessful, and the newborn baby boy would pass away only 39 hours later, on August 9, 1963. The death of their newborn son, Patrick, brought the president and first lady closer than before, as observed by those around them. Regrettably, the effects of how the loss transformed their relationship were unable to be fully observed, as just three months later, the Kennedys were due for a trip to Dallas in November 1963. On November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy and First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy were riding in a convertible, waving to cheering crowds, when the president was assassinated by gunman Lee Harvey Oswald. Writing in his memoir, Secret Service agent Clint Hill described how Jackie held her husband in her arms, shouting, quote, Jack, Jack, what have they done to you? Hill also mentions how Jackie refused to let go of her husband because she didn't want the crowd to see him dying. And I'm saying, Jack, Jack, can you hear me? Jack, I love you, Jack. In the immediate years after the death of her husband, Jackie Kennedy lived a quiet life with her children. Initially living in Georgetown, she moved her family to New York City for its anonymity and familiarity, after the Washington, D.C. home failed to provide her with the privacy she desired. She came out of a reclusive lifestyle to help her brother-in-law, Robert F. Kennedy, with his presidential campaign. However, on June 5, 1968, just after midnight, Robert Kennedy was shot three times after his speech at a hotel in Los Angeles. Senator Kennedy has been shot. Is that possible? According to Vanity Fair, when Jackie's brother-in-law, Stas Rodswell, called her at 4 a.m. asking how RFK was, she had no idea of the incident, telling him that Robert was fine and had just won California. Radswell had to break the news to her, and once again, Jackie was plunged into grief by the loss of another person close to her. The second Kennedy assassination made her start to fear for her kids' safety as well. Jackie reportedly told a friend, quote, they're killing Kennedys in America. The Bouvier sisters, Jacqueline and Lee, were a glamorously famous pair who always had a complex relationship. Growing up with divorced parents, they relied on each other immensely, but a sibling rivalry would persist throughout their lives. When Jackie married John F. Kennedy, she ascended to the center of the public eye, while her equally talented sister became at risk of being eclipsed entirely. A pattern began to emerge during Jackie's reign as First Lady. Wanting her sister there for support, Jackie would ask Lee to accompany and help her during various trips, but the media attention was always on Jackie, who would ironically be praised for her fashion sense even when it was her sister who was instrumental in selecting her wardrobe. Around this time, Lee's marriage to Stas Rodswell was breaking down, and she found herself charmed by the Greek shipping tycoon Aristotle Onassis. The Kennedys greatly distrusted Onassis, though, and disapproved. After the death of her newborn, Jackie was invited to go on a cruise with the couple, 
during which she took the opportunity to convince Lee not to marry Onassis. However, the trip seemed to be the starting point for a future development. About five years after the assassination of JFK, it was Jackie who married Onassis in October 1968. Lee was reported to have felt betrayed and devastated. While she publicly wished them well, the sisters' relationship would never fully recover. Jacqueline Kennedy's marriage to Aristotle Onassis came as a shock to the public, seeing as it occurred only a few months after Robert Kennedy's assassination in 1968. The two also had practically nothing in common, not to mention that Onassis was 23 years her senior. As told by Vanity Fair, it became apparent that the marriage was less based on love and more on benefits. Jackie Kennedy desired the stability and lavish life that the Onassis fortune could provide, while Onassis saw the world-famous former first lady as, quote, the ultimate trophy. Unfortunately, the incompatibility of the couple quickly had Onassis starting up his longtime affair with opera diva Maria Callas again only a month after the wedding. The couple would also get into arguments about Jackie's spending. History News Network claims that Jackie always had a shopping addiction, with entire rooms at her Fifth Avenue apartment filled with purchases that were never even removed from their boxes. Eventually, the shipping tycoon took up distastefully referring to his wife as, quote, the widow, according to time. The early 1970s once again saw Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis suffering loss. In March 1975, after less than seven years of marriage, her husband, Aristotle Onassis, passed away from bronchial pneumonia. He had been in the hospital for five weeks, undergoing a gallbladder operation, and was also under observation for a debilitating neurological disease, which had affected his heart. The cortisone treatment he was receiving had weakened his immune system, resulting in the pneumonia's fatal effects. Shortly after, it came out to the press that Aristotle had been planning to divorce Jackie, with the shipping tycoon consulting with his lawyer multiple times regarding the matter as recently as December 1974, as reported by the New York Times. Aristotle also apparently looked into having a private investigator dig up dirt on Jackie that could be used in the divorce proceedings. However, his daughter, Christina Onassis, denied the claims. The sudden death of those connected to her seemed to follow Jacqueline Kennedy. Even after her second husband passed away, and Jackie distanced herself from the Onassis family, tragedy still struck. In November of 1988, Christina Onassis, Jackie's former stepdaughter, died suddenly in Argentina at only 37 years old. The cause of her death is said to have been a heart attack brought on by years of drug abuse. It was often reported that Kennedy had a strained relationship with her stepdaughter, with Christina seeing her new mother as a gold digger and calling her, quote, my father's unfortunate obsession. There were also rumors of the two disputing Kennedy's inheritance following Aristotle Onassis' death. In a 1975 statement, though, Christina insisted the stories were not true and revealed she had a friendly and respectful relationship with her stepmother. In January 1994, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Found mostly in her neck, chest, and abdomen, she began her chemotherapy sessions and was seeing optimistic progress in the beginning. In mid-March, however, she was experiencing pain throughout her legs, and it was found that the cancer, which affects the lymph system, had disappeared from its initial locations and spread to her brain and spinal cord. By May, her health had worsened considerably. On May 16th, she was diagnosed with and treated for pneumonia. Two days later, it was found that her liver had huge amounts of the lymphoma and that there was little that further treatment could do. Not wishing to spend her last moments at a hospital, Jackie Kennedy Onassis was released. On May 19, 1994, she passed away late at night, surrounded by her family and friends at her home in Manhattan at the age of 64. The Kennedy family was iconic, glamorous, and very polarizing. They created as many enemies as friends, and they saw many individuals as enemies. Here are some famous people the Kennedys couldn't stand. While both John and Robert Kennedy became known throughout the 1960s as supporters of the civil rights movement, that didn't stop them from holding a lot of animosity toward the face of the movement itself. According to the King Institute, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was the subject of FBI investigations from the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955 until his assassination in 1968. The investigations during the Kennedy administration were carried out with their knowledge and approval. Their relationship was, as described by the Christian Science Monitor, one of, quote, wary allies. 
In October 1960, then-candidate Kennedy made a call of support to Dr. King's wife, Coretta Scott King, during one of his many imprisonments. Robert Kennedy, JFK's campaign manager, called officials in the state of Georgia and a judge to help get the civil rights icon released from jail. Many believe this public act helped shore up Kennedy's election chances. Despite this, the Kennedys were wary of coming across as too strong on civil rights, while King and the people in the movement constantly held the administration's feet to the fire. According to The Atlantic, when the Kennedy administration learned of a connection between King and the New York lawyer and financer for the Communist Party USA, Stanley David Levinson, RFK ordered the FBI to have wiretaps placed on King's phone. The wiretaps introduced the Kennedys to King's extramarital affairs. Jackie Kennedy followed her husband's and brother-in-law's belief about Dr. King. According to Politico, the First Lady referred to King as, quote, phony and terrible in a conversation with historian Arthur Schlesinger. Talk about keeping your friends close and keep your enemies closer. By 1963, President Kennedy had spoken privately with his wife about his worries of an LBJ presidency and sought a way for his brother Bobby, who was the Attorney General, to take the White House following JFK's presidency. My colleagues, including Senator Kennedy and Senator Symington and 62 other beloved Democrats, had selected me as their leader. Jackie remembers that her husband had no plans for selecting another vice president during his administration, but looked forward to the 1968 Democratic primary if he could influence the party to select another candidate aside from Johnson. Still, JFK was willing to treat LBJ with respect during their time in Washington. The same could not be said of Johnson and Robert Kennedy. According to Politico, Johnson hated the president's younger brother to the point that, during his own presidency following JFK's assassination, he signed a nepotism statute. The law was seemingly a shot at Bobby, whose appointment as attorney general had sparked controversy. In 1968, Johnson faced off against RFK one last time. The escalating Vietnam War had made Johnson very unpopular, and in March, RFK announced that he would run for president. The history of conflict among nations does not record another such lengthy and consistent chronicle of error as we have shown in Vietnam. Despite being the incumbent, Johnson saw the writing on the wall. Two weeks later, he announced he would not seek a second term. And I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. It is almost ridiculous how many attempts on the life of Fidel Castro were made by the United States government. According to CNN, the Cuban revolutionary survived over 600 assassination attempts. Castro's reign in Cuba, just a stone's throw away from the United States, irked both JFK and RFK, and the two obsessed over ways to topple the communist leader. In just his third month in office, President Kennedy authorized an invasion of Cuba made up of 1,400 Cuban exiles trained and armed by the CIA. The plan, according to the JFK Library, started during the Eisenhower administration in March 1960, and the U.S. hoped that local Cubans would join with the exiled invasion force and overthrow Castro. On April 17, 1961, the Bay of Pigs invasion launched. By April 19, 1961, it was over. The exiles were captured, Castro's popularity was increased, and the Kennedy administration was left with egg on their faces for attempting to topple a foreign nation. The administration exchanged $53 million worth of baby food and medicine for the return of the captured soldiers. While JFK questioned their ability to get rid of Castro, Bobby Kennedy took command of the situation, and the administration organized Operation Mongoose, which sought to destabilize Cuba's economy and society in order to undermine Castro and his government. J. Edgar Hoover was instrumental in founding the FBI in 1935 and was its director until his death in 1972. Hoover compiled files on seemingly every figure in D.C., including the young Kennedys, and he let them know it. When Hoover became the head of the FBI, he had a very close relationship with both Franklin Roosevelt and Dwight Eisenhower, whom he saw as an ideological ally. Throughout the 1950s, the FBI expanded their number of illegal microphones and wiretaps. While President Truman didn't have the best relationship with Hoover and the FBI, they were best friends compared to Hoover's relationship with the Kennedys. Unlike previous administrations, during which Hoover could work directly with the president, John Kennedy's attorney general and de facto protector Bobby Kennedy made it so that Hoover had to go through him to get to JFK. In response, Hoover cut the number of political intelligence reports to the White House and started to delve into JFK's personal life. Hoover leveraged Kennedy's affairs to get his own agenda across. 
The Washington Post reported that in 1963, Hoover told RFK that he'd discovered payments his brother made to a jilted lover. Furthermore, it was also later revealed that Hoover blackmailed Bobby to wiretap Dr. King with evidence of JFK's affair with Judith Campbell, who also shared a relationship with infamous Chicago mobster Sam Giancana. The Kennedy family's history of feuding started long before John and Bobby. The two brothers followed in their father's footsteps, who, while working as the U.S. ambassador to the United Kingdom, had a tense relationship with President Franklin Roosevelt. Joseph Kennedy Sr. originally had a great relationship with FDR. In 1918, the businessman entered politics when he contributed money to the campaign of his father-in-law, John F. Fitzgerald. During the same time, Kennedy started to support Roosevelt. FDR did not forget Kennedy's support, and after he became president in 1933, he appointed Joseph as head of the Securities and Exchange Commission. However, Joseph Kennedy had other goals, like running for president following the end of FDR's second term. In 1938, Kennedy took a major step toward the Oval Office when FDR made him the ambassador to the United Kingdom. Kennedy entered into a political whirlwind as Europe was on the cusp of war. Despite both English officials and FDR having given up on appeasing Hitler, Kennedy believed he could pay Germany to end their territorial expansion throughout Europe. Kennedy then met with a top Nazi economic advisor in London, thus going against FDR's orders. By the autumn of 1940, Kennedy was forced to resign from his position following controversial comments stating that democracy was dead in England and questioning if it could survive in the US. The comments also ended his chances at the presidency. Some feuds might end in a fistfight. Some feuds end in cutting a person out of one's life. This feud between Kennedy and the leader of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, nearly ended the world. JFK's first year in office was a disaster from a foreign policy perspective. When he and Khrushchev held a meeting at Vienna only two months after the failed Bay of Pigs, Kennedy was overwhelmed by Khrushchev's experience and intelligence. Two months later, the Soviets began construction on the Berlin Wall, separating East Berlin from West Berlin. The next year, their feud almost reached apocalyptic levels during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the USSR placed nuclear missiles in Cuba. Bobby Kennedy had spent the year following the Bay of Pigs preparing for the possibility of Cuba being used as a weapons hub. In the early days, he kept the option of invasion on the table. However, the Kennedy administration avoided nuclear war by agreeing to remove their own missiles in Turkey and promising not to invade Cuba again in exchange for the Soviets removing their own missiles from the island nation, thus ending the two-week situation. The President of the United States is the Commander-in-Chief of the military. Throughout the 1950s, the Commander-in-Chief was Dwight Eisenhower, a conservative, older man who had built his reputation as the supreme Allied commander in Europe during World War II. So it's not shocking that the men of Eisenhower's era clashed with the young JFK. To his credit, Kennedy was a World War II hero himself, rescuing 11 of his Navy men and swimming for hours to an island after their ship went down from torpedo fire. Still, Kennedy wasn't as hawkish during his presidency as other officials in his administration. Following the Bay of Pigs failure, JFK questioned the CIA and National Security Council and concluded that he could not solely rely on them. The administration's policymaking process changed, with a greater willingness to consider the pros and cons of decisions and how they would affect allies. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, this process helped prevent an invasion of Cuba, which would have led to nuclear war. This was despite pressure from individuals such as Air Force Chief of Staff General Curtis LeMay, who was recorded arguing with the president. According to the Oregonian, when JFK was assassinated, Teamsters Union President Jimmy Hoffa stood up in his chair and cheered at the announcement. Hoffa's anger was, however, less directed toward JFK and more at his younger brother Bobby Kennedy, who was involved in a, quote, blood feud with Hoffa, according to Kennedy's aide Pierre Salinger. In 1957, the 32-year-old Bobby Kennedy was made chief counsel of Senator John McClellan's committee, whose primary focus was to investigate organized crime and corruption within labor unions. History states that this was where Hoffa and RFK first came in contact and began their contentious relationship, as Kennedy questioned the leader of the Teamsters Union. Hoffa took enjoyment in antagonizing the young Kennedy, while Kennedy's profile was raised throughout the hearings. Hoffa beat the charges levied against him during the 1950s, making him more popular within the Teamsters, though when JFK became president and Bobby his AG, the younger Kennedy set up a Get Hoffa squad made up of 20 prosecutors in the Department of Justice. In 1964, Hoffa's luck ran out. 
That March, Hoffa was found guilty of bribery and jury tampering. And in July, he was found guilty of misusing the union's pension funds. I'm going to jail. You understand? I'm going to prison because of you. The relationship between Marilyn Monroe and JFK, while certainly not Kennedy's only affair, is hands down the most discussed of the president's extramarital relationships, as Monroe and JFK were two of the biggest sex symbols of their time. Because of this, it has become close to impossible to nail down the extent of their relationship, as well as Monroe's relationship with Bobby Kennedy. According to People, Monroe and JFK were introduced to each other in 1954 by actor Peter Lawford, who was married to Bobby's and John's sister at the time. Monroe's biographer James Spader said that Monroe and JFK had a relationship for a time, but after getting bored, Kennedy, quote, passed her off to Bobby Kennedy. In May 1962, Monroe performed at a birthday celebration for JFK, which involved her singing a sultry version of Happy Birthday. Understandably, Jackie Kennedy was fuming, though surprisingly not at Monroe, but at her brother-in-law who had arranged for the performance. Four months after the performance, Monroe would die of a barbiturate overdose. While the coroner concluded it was a, quote, probable suicide, unsubstantiated conspiracy theories have emerged that John, Bobby, or someone in the government had Monroe killed. Furthermore, just two years after her death and a year after JFK's assassination, Business Insider reports that the FBI contacted Bobby Kennedy about a book being made blaming him for Monroe's death and revealing their alleged affair. John F. Kennedy Jr. was the second child and only living son of John F. Kennedy and Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy. His life tragically came to an end on July 16, 1999, when a plane he was piloting crashed off the coast of Massachusetts. He was flying alongside his wife, Carolyn Bassett Kennedy, and her sister, Lauren Bassett, so the three of them could attend a wedding on Martha's Vineyard. All three were killed. Many questions still remain as to what happened that stormy night when the Piper Saratoga light aircraft left an airfield in New Jersey and never made it to its destination. I know there wasn't a moon out, so it was probably a pretty dark night. Possibly due to the heavy storms or that JFK Jr. had earned his pilot's license just the year before, it is believed Kennedy became disoriented during the flight. The Washington Post reported that investigators determined Kennedy lost control of the plane, plunging into the ocean at 53 miles per hour. Stephen Gillen, historian and college friend of Kennedy, told People he should not have gone up that night. At the first sign of danger, he should have done what a lot of pilots did that night and flew inland, away from the ocean, spend the night somewhere, and then pick up the next morning. Instead, Navy and Coast Guard divers scoured the ocean for five days to find the plane and recover the bodies. All three were still strapped to their seats. Six years prior to their death, Kennedy met Calvin Klein publicist Bassett in 1992. What ensued was a fairy tale like romance that soon became tabloid fodder. Perhaps because of the incessant attention the golden couple was receiving, the pair later married in a very private ceremony in 1996. Once the media learned of their nuptials, the frenzy only grew. People reported that this severely impacted Bissette. Kennedy had been in the spotlight since birth. However, she had been unwillingly thrust into it. Bissette reportedly became reclusive and spent most of her time at home. Additionally, it said she felt uncomfortable with Kennedy's family. The couple's passionate relationship soon became troubled. Kennedy and Bissett were pictured having a public argument and her fear of the paparazzi was said to have intensified. Vanity Fair states that in an effort to salvage their relationship, the couple decided to attend the wedding of Kennedy's cousin, Rory Kennedy, in Hyannis Port. Kennedy, who had 300 hours of flight experience, agreed to fly them there. The set's sister, Lauren, decided to join as long as they dropped her off at Martha's Vineyard, where she would be spending the weekend with friends. Whether due to little visibility or an inexperienced pilot, the plane crashed into the Atlantic Ocean. All three were in their 30s at the time of their deaths. Despite their strained marriage, friends and family believed the couple would have worked through their issues and would now be living a peaceful life with children. However, they died without any children, and if she had survived him, Bissette would have inherited all of Kennedy's fortune. His will, which was filed in court later that year, gave some of his estate to charity. However, nearly all of his possessions went to his sister, Caroline Kennedy Schlossberg, and her three children, Rose Kennedy Schlossberg, Tatiana Kennedy 
Schlossberg and John B. Kennedy Schlossberg. The children were aged 11, 9, and 6 respectively at the time, but the will which included his Manhattan apartment and his share of the Kennedy family's sprawling Martha's Vineyard estate did not specify any monetary value, but most estimates put it between 30 and 100 million dollars. Although the will did not list Kennedy's belongings or their worth, it's expected that items from his father, John F. Kennedy, such as a Cartier watch and money clip, would be included. The court filings show JFK Jr. also left money from the trust to former employees, 14 friends, and family members. This included his lawyer, his personal assistant, his godchildren, and even a former governess. He also provided funds for his father's presidential library and a charity he founded in 1985 to assist those who are developmentally disabled called Reaching Up. In 2006, another undisclosed sum of money went to settle a wrongful death lawsuit the Bissett family filed against the Kennedy estate for the deaths of Carolyn Bissett Kennedy and Lauren Bissett. Brainwashing, mind-altering drugs, and rogue espionage? It sounds like something out of a James Bond flick. But according to conspiracy theorists, it was all behind the killing of a major American politician. Let's start with some of the basic details. Like many members of his family, Robert F. Kennedy chartered an impressive course through the governmental ranks. After serving as Attorney General during his brother John's presidency and then as a United States Senator, he announced in 1968 that he would be running for the Democratic presidential nomination. On June 4, 1968, Kennedy had just won the California primary and was giving a speech at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. With the excited cheering of his supporters behind him, he began to leave the hotel through the kitchen. But just after the clocks struck midnight, 24-year-old Sirhan Sirhan appeared from the crowd wielding an eight-shot revolver. He fired a number of times, wounding a few people before being wrestled to the ground. At some point, Kennedy was hit just by his ear. Sirhan was arrested and ultimately given the death sentence, which has since been commuted to life in prison. Kennedy was taken to the hospital for surgery to remove the bullets, but he died at 1.44 a.m. on June 6th. Uh, and he was shot in the head. Yes, he was. On the surface, the story of Robert Kennedy's assassination seems pretty straightforward, but the devil is always in the details. For one thing, Sirhan Sirhan was standing in front of Kennedy when he began to fire, but Kennedy took shots from behind, and investigations by the coroner uncovered powder burns on his jacket and hair, indications that those shots were fired point blank. And as far as anyone can tell, Sirhan didn't seem to be standing there at all. Furthermore, Sirhan's revolver held only eight bullets, but many speculate that there were more than eight shots fired, which would indicate that there was a second shooter. Photos from the crime scene seem to show pieces of metal, potentially bullets, lodged in the doorframe. And just to make things stranger, internal police documents reference the idea that the bullets were fired from different guns, and that the bullet that hit Kennedy didn't come from Sirhan's gun. The more you read into Robert Kennedy's assassination, the more it starts to smell a little like a cover-up. At his trial, Sirhan Sirhan confessed to the crime, but also admitted later that he only did so at his attorney's recommendation. And that same attorney decided to make the argument that Sirhan had diminished capacity, essentially a guilty verdict, but one that might avoid the death penalty. And that was done without ever bringing up the fact that Kennedy was shot from behind, a detail that would have presumably helped Sirhan's case. I really don't remember things clearly about it. On top of that, Paul Schrade, a friend of Kennedy's who was also shot and wounded during the crime, has said that he believes the police rushed the job, wanting to close the case quickly. They refused to follow leads and only reluctantly reopened parts of the investigation years later. And investigators also insisted that those supposed bullets in the doorframe weren't bullets, and then the evidence was destroyed. To be entirely clear, Sirhan Sirhan was caught at the scene of the crime and he confessed to everything at his trial. He even confessed to having reasons to dislike Robert Kennedy. Furthermore, he brought a gun to the scene of the assassination, which he'd staked out for about 30 minutes prior, and investigations of his personal belongings didn't help him either. He had a newspaper clipping that was critical of Kennedy in his pocket, and investigators later found notebooks at his home with the words RFK must die scribbled in them over and over. But Sirhan has since admitted that he doesn't actually remember writing any of those notes. As reported by The Guardian, the writing itself is oddly robotic, and Sirhan has further admitted that he actually doesn't remember the shooting at all. As for what he does remember, he recalls, quote, being led into a dark place by a girl who wanted coffee, and he also remembers being choked by an angry mob. This has led to the theory that he was in a brainwashed trance, forced into carrying out the deed by someone much more powerful. I was worried about saving my own butt from, from execution. The idea of a brainwashed assassin sounds like something out of the Manchurian Candidate, but it may be closer to reality than you'd initially suspect. In short, the CIA spent a significant portion of the 1950s and 60s researching mind control. American POWs reportedly returned from stints in Korea having been brainwashed into believing communist ideas. 
The CIA suddenly felt they were at a distinct disadvantage when it came to these complex mind games, and naturally then spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to weaponize hypnosis and drugs. A project known as MKUltra is one of the big names when it comes to this particular area of research. It revolved around the use of drugs, especially LSD, as a means of brainwashing subjects. Consent for many of these experiments was dubious at best, and the whole venture was both very secret and very illegal. When you look at publicly available records, the whole endeavor doesn't seem all that successful, but that may not be the whole story. CIA agents have claimed that they couldn't remember the details while on trial, and all physical records were destroyed. Combined with the fact that long-term advanced hypnosis techniques have largely untested results, maybe brainwashing isn't totally out of the question. To be fair, picking apart strange inconsistencies isn't enough to actually implicate the entire CIA in the assassination of Robert Kennedy. True, the agency was involved in some pretty shady work, but speculation is hardly concrete evidence. But that doesn't change the fact that there were members of the CIA who just didn't like Kennedy. As reported by The Guardian, David Sanchez Morales was a senior CIA agent often known for his work with covert operations, who was pretty open about his dislike for the Kennedy family. For one thing, he blamed them at large for the failure of the Bay of Pigs operation in 1961. Almost a decade and a half later, he reportedly told friends that Robert Kennedy deserved to be assassinated. According to the book A Lie Too Big to Fail, Robert A. Mayhew, an ex-FBI agent who handled some of the CIA's more unsavory missions, was also spotted effectively celebrating Kennedy's death as it cleared the way for Richard Nixon to win the upcoming election. On top of all that, Kennedy also directly opposed the CIA's power, and he could have eventually pressed the organization for more answers about the death of his brother, whose own assassination has also been the target of prominent conspiracy theories. This was a military-style ambush from start to finish. This was a coup d'etat. It's one thing to take inconsistencies and weave them into a fantastical tale of conspiracy, but it's another to start factoring in actual sightings of certain people around the scene of the crime. One theory, put forward by writer and filmmaker Shane O'Sullivan, points out that three high-level CIA operatives were all near the Ambassador Hotel around the time of Kennedy's assassination for unclear reasons. David Sanchez Morales, who was supposedly stationed in Laos at the time, was caught on camera in the Ambassador Hotel just after the end of Kennedy's speech, only to reappear again 30 minutes later. Morales' associate Gordon Campbell was also spotted in that same room around the exact same time, and both men had actually been seen hanging around the local area in the year leading up to the assassination. Then there was also Campbell's meeting with George Jonidas, one of the CIA's chiefs of psychological warfare operations just prior to the shooting. It could be just a coincidence, but the presence of multiple CIA operatives does raise some eyebrows. It's hard not to imagine that they were planning something. When you consider all of the weird facts around the assassination of Robert Kennedy, you might start thinking that you'd need a really specific person to actually head this entire operation. And that's where Robert Mayhew comes into the picture. As recounted by A Lie Too Big to Fail, Mayhew formerly worked for the FBI, but then the CIA began tapping him for certain covert operations. Eventually, some people began to actually see him as an assassin, or even as a fixer for Howard Hughes, who was also known for financing covert CIA operations. He's even said to be the inspiration for the Mission Impossible TV show. Over the years, a number of people, including Mayhew's associates and even FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, have outright claimed that he was the one behind Robert Kennedy's death, and it's easy to see why. Between his access to the LAPD, Sirhan Sirhan's defense team, trained CIA agents, and the results of those top-secret brainwashing experiments, Mayhew really does seem like the perfect guy for the job. When it comes to the potential plan put together by Robert Mayhew, there's another name that's worth considering, Thane Caesar. As covered by A Lie Too Big to Fail, he was known as the CIA's contract agent, which sounds suspicious, especially when you consider that his actual employment records are pretty hazy. He was holding Robert Kennedy's arm at the moment of the shooting, and he admitted to drawing, although not firing, his gun at that same moment. Thane Eugene Caesar was on the door. He was on different doors. He followed Kennedy in, which he was not supposed to do. A lie too big to fail also suggests that Caesar was actually on the scene to fill his role in a rather complicated version of the multiple shooter scenario. Essentially, he was there to hold Kennedy down, thereby incapacitating him and potentially firing off a couple of shots himself, but he didn't deliver the killing blow. Rather, another accomplice appeared with an easily concealable gun, firing a couple of shots into the back of Kennedy's head. And that's not all. At the same moment, another shooter appeared in front of Kennedy, somewhere near Sirhan Sirhan, to fire off a few shots just to make sure it looked like Sirhan had committed the crime himself. According to this theory, Sirhan was only ever shooting blanks. Sirhan was not in position to shoot Robert Kennedy after his first two shots. A lie too big to fail emphasizes that this was no small-scale operation. Instead, it required a whole team to make it work. So while there was a group of people tasked with actually killing Robert Kennedy and framing Sirhan Sirhan, there were others who needed to keep the entire operation running smoothly. 
This theory mentions an accomplice stationed at one of the fire exits, a man who stood out for communicating on a suspicious radio. He was likely there both to allow Sirhan entry to the building and to ensure that the door wouldn't be blocked when the assassins needed to make their escape. What's more, there is a reference to two girls in polka dot dresses, one of whom accompanied Sirhan upstairs to the kitchen and another who escorted a different man downstairs. Why would there be a need for what appeared to be two separate teams of assassins? Just in case Kennedy didn't end up exiting through the kitchen, the whole operation had a backup plan. No matter what path he took after his speech, the assassination could still go off without a hitch. In the aftermath of Robert Kennedy's assassination, there have been some suspicious things uttered by a number of people potentially involved in the supposed plot. A Lie Too Big to Fail focuses squarely on some of the diary entries of John Meyer, specifically regarding the behavior of Robert Mayhew in the days following the crime. Meyer began making connections and asking questions upon hearing that Thane Caesar had been at the ambassador that day, but doing so brought swift retribution from Mayhew. It was a clear threat to stop looking into things, and the fury laced in the words surprised Meyer. And this apparently wasn't the only time that Mayhew acted shifty and irritable about information surrounding the assassination. And if that's not enough, David Sanchez Morales reportedly told a group of friends in 1973, I was in Dallas when we got the son of a bitch, and I was in Los Angeles when we got the little bastard. In light of everything, it's hard not to interpret that as a confession. Infidelity, disease, and faith after loss. This isn't the plot to a drama movie. This is Jackie and JFK's real life in its stormiest moments. Back before such relationships became fairly unheard of, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Charles Bartlett was a close friend and confidant of John F. Kennedy, so much so that in 1951, he played matchmaker for what would become one of America's most iconic couples. It was at one of Bartlett's dinner parties that John F. Kennedy first met Jacqueline Bouvier. At the time, Bouvier was working as a reporter for the Washington Times Herald. At the time, she later explained to Edward R. Murrow, her professional interests came before any romantic ones. Shortly after meeting Kennedy, Bouvier interviewed him for her paper. When Murrow asked whether marriage or interviews with a politician required more diplomacy, Bouvier let her husband answer. Well, now, which requires the most diplomacy, to interview senators or to be married to one? Well, not Being married to one, I guess. <laughs> Bartlett largely kept JFK's secrets, but once evidence of Kennedy's many love affairs came to light, Bartlett mused that his friend might not have been suited to marriage, but that he never would have become president without Bouvier by his side. While Jack won the votes, she won the hearts of America. John F. Kennedy and Jackie Bouvier dated for two years before announcing their engagement on June 24, 1953. As both were members of prominent society families, the announcement was a notable affair, and its historical significance only increased as the Kennedys rose to political power. So it's perhaps understandable that a venue would claim to be the spot where Kennedy first popped the question, and that there might be some competition for that claim. Two stories exist around where and how Kennedy proposed to Bouvier. The Omni Hotels and Resorts chain claim that it happened at one of their hotels. In their version, the couple was staying at Omni Parker House in Boston, Massachusetts, and eating in the hotel restaurant when Kennedy got down on one knee and presented Bouvier with a custom-made emerald and diamond ring. Omni claims it was the most romantic moment in the hotel's history. We insist that this was the formal proposal and all the rest are all alternative facts. <laughs> Unless it happened at Martin's Tavern, Martin's is an historic restaurant in Georgetown that was frequently patronized by Kennedy and Bouvier. The restaurant claims the proposal happened in Booth 3. They even got the statement of a witness, former ambassador Marion Smoke. But Smoke didn't claim to have seen the proposal, only that he saw the couple at Martin's on June 24th, and that news of the engagement circulated through the restaurant. The relationship between John F. Kennedy and Jackie Bouvier was complicated from the beginning. They had similar backgrounds, shared a knack for social engagements, and had a genuine attraction and affection for one another. But their engagement and marriage was as much a political consideration as a personal commitment. According to Robert Dalek's An Unfinished Life, John F. Kennedy, 1917 to 1963, Kennedy would have been happy to remain a bachelor, and at least one close friend suspected he would have had his 1952 Senate bid failed. But it didn't, and the realities of the time required any senator intent on higher office to be married. Kennedy was driven even then, although his father worried that his son would still get cold feet on the way to the altar. You're pretty much in love with him, aren't you? <laughs> oh, no. 
For her part, Bouvier was under no illusions about the political component of her relationship with Kennedy. She wrote in her diary that she had an intimation that Jack would have a profound and possibly disturbing effect on her life. In letters to Irish priest Joseph Leonard, she expressed amazement at the level of ambition on display among the political class she encountered through Kennedy. She compared her fiancé to Macbeth due to the enormity of his appetite for high office. Bouvier also confided to Leonard that she had reservations about the impending marriage. Her own father was a notorious philanderer, whose cheating took a heavy toll on his wife, and Bouvier saw the same quality in Kennedy. When John F. Kennedy and Jackie Bouvier became Mr. and Mrs. Kennedy on September 12, 1953, they did so in style. Their wedding was held at St. Mary's Catholic Church in Newport, Rhode Island, and the reception at the Victorian Hammersmith Farm Estate. Both boasted a massive attendance. The wedding had over 800 guests. The reception, over 1,200. Pope Pius XII sent a blessing to be read, Robert F. Kennedy was the best man, and the wedding cake was over four feet tall. Musical entertainment included noted tenor Luigi Vena and the Meyer Davis Orchestra. Jackie's dress, accentuated by her grandmother's veil and a few choice pieces of jewelry gifted by John, remains a model for wedding gowns to this day. According to Vogue, the dress was designed by Anne Lowe, one of the first leading black fashion designers who built a career out of creating fashions for women of the social register. For how celebrated the look has become, it was actually a hastily assembled replacement for the original dress, destroyed by a burst pipe. Lowe's closest collaborator on the dress wasn't the bride, but Joseph Kennedy, who subsequently left Lowe's name out of the wedding coverage he arranged. The Kennedys honeymooned in Acapulco, John messaged his parents from there to report that everything was going well. According to Frederick Lodgeval's JFK Coming of Age in the American Century, 1917 to 1956, Kennedy's exact words were, at last I know the true meaning of rapture. It's no secret by now that John F. Kennedy was not a faithful husband. Within 15 months of marrying Jackie Bouvier Kennedy, he was back to his womanizing ways. Where sex was concerned, John F. Kennedy thought he was untouchable, invulnerable. So wandering was his eye that he reportedly left his wife alone at parties to fool around with female guests. And in 1956, he carried on with several women on his yacht, even as Jackie suffered through delivery of their stillborn child. To what extent Jackie knew about John's infidelities and how she felt about them is a matter of some contention among journalists and historians. Author Sally Bedell Smith wrote in Vanity Fair that while Jackie was well aware of the affairs, she was often happy to feign ignorance. She would occasionally make private jokes or, in more unhappy moments, seek counseling from cardiologist friend Frank Finnerty, but she was resigned to it. She reportedly told Adley Stevenson, I don't care how many girls Jack sleeps with, as long as I know, he knows it's wrong. Others have reported that Jackie was more confrontational about the affairs. Author J. Randy Taraborelli told People that tensions became so pitched that Jackie considered divorce in 1956, after the stillbirth. Her sister and her mother, both aware of John's affairs, convinced her to stay. They considered being cheated on an occupational hazard of being married to a powerful man. In a letter to Fletcher Knable, Jackie Kennedy described herself and her husband as icebergs, a small portion of their lives visible, the greater mass submerged. Among the matters kept below was how difficult it was for them to conceive a child. Jackie suffered a miscarriage in 1955 and delivered a stillborn daughter in 1956. When they did have a son, John Jr., he was born prematurely and suffered from weak lungs in early life. By the time John Jr. and their daughter, Caroline, came into the world, JFK was far less callous about his wife and children. He was at Jackie's side with her favorite flowers for Caroline's birth and noticeably swelled with emotion when discussing his daughter. The couple were expecting a third child in 1963. But on August 7th, 20 years to the day that JFK was rescued during World War II, Jackie went into premature labor. Their son, Patrick, came six weeks early and, despite the best efforts of doctors, died of hyaline membrane disease within days. Both parents were devastated, 
but family and friends reported that the tragedy did leave one positive legacy. In the months remaining before JFK's assassination, he and Jackie were much more publicly affectionate with one another. Some of the ice, it seemed, had emerged from the depths. As the youngest man ever elected to the presidency, John F. Kennedy was seen by the public as a healthy, clean-cut shot of energy into the highest levels of power. But, contrary to the image he projected, Kennedy's presidency and his marriage were dogged by his myriad health conditions. In 2019, PBS published a list of all the physical ailments he suffered, including many that were kept well hidden from the public eye during John's lifetime. If the public knew how many medical problems he had, I think it would have uh, destroyed his presidential ambitions. Besides a bout of scarlet fever in his youth, the president suffered from spastic colitis, prostate and urinary tract issues, allergies, such severe lower back pain that he was initially rejected from military service in World War II, and Addison's disease, a life-threatening hormonal deficiency. He was so ill that his father had put cortisone treatments in safe deposit boxes around the country if he ever needed them because of his Addison's disease. The steroids used to treat his Addison's led to osteoporosis, which only further damaged Kennedy's back. Seven surgeries between 1944 and 1957 couldn't fix it, and he fell so ill after one procedure that a priest was called to administer last rites. The steroids and other medications came with side effects. In 1962, according to The Atlantic, Jackie complained to her husband's gastroenterologist that the antihistamines used for his allergies resulted in depression. The doctor's answer was a two-day treatment with the antipsychotic Stelazine, with reported total success. But the rest of John's many ailments would follow him to the end of his days. It might well be assumed that a president and vice president would get along, or at least have confidence in one another. After all, the president must have confidence that, should anything happen to them, their running mate could serve as chief executive of the world's most powerful country. But, according to a series of interviews given by Jackie Kennedy in 1964, neither she nor her husband thought much of Lyndon B. Johnson. According to Jackie, John not only didn't like Johnson, but never wanted him as a running mate and actively feared for the country, should he become president. John discussed his worries with his wife and his brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy. No thought was given to dropping Johnson from the 1964 ticket, but the Kennedy brothers discussed ways they might maneuver around Johnson to find a new standard bearer for the Democratic Party for the 1968 presidential election. The same interviews, kept private by the Kennedy family for decades, revealed Jackie's thoughts about the second lady, too. According to the Daily Beast, she described Lady Bird Johnson as so devoted and obedient to her husband that she seemed more like a hunting dog than a marriage partner. Context is important in this case. The interviews were recorded during tensions between Johnson and Robert Kennedy, and Jackie separated Johnson's deficient political skills, in her view, from his personal qualities. A marriage connected to a demanding job, let alone the presidency, will inevitably face some stress, but the ongoing health woes and extramarital affairs of John F. Kennedy only made things more difficult for Jackie Kennedy. The degree of independence Jack maintained shocked her in the early days of their marriage. And in private correspondence with Father Joseph Leonard, Jackie confided that life with a powerful public figure was taking its toll. As reported by the Irish Times, she wrote, Maybe I'm just dazzled and picture myself in a glittering world of crowned heads and men of destiny, and not just a sad little housewife. That world can be very glamorous from the outside, but if you're in it and you're lonely, it could be a hell. Despite the many tensions and complications in their marriage, John and Jackie were always able to reconcile. I am the man who accompanied Jacqueline Kennedy to Paris, and I've enjoyed it. Jackie turned for help to the Catholic faith that she shared with her husband. In one of her letters to Leonard, Jackie cited her religion as helping her to find some good after the tragedy of her stillborn daughter, Arabella. She and John grew closer together, but after John's assassination, she suffered a crisis of faith. She told Leonard that she felt bitter and that only the hope of seeing her husband again sustained her belief. The life and death of Bobby Kennedy is one of the great legends of American political history. But who was the woman who stood by his side? The Kennedy family is one of the most powerful and prestigious dynasties in American history. 
You would be hard-pressed to find a family in the world of U.S. politics that wields as much influence or has acquired quite as much money as this one. When the family arrived in America from Ireland in the 1840s, they became heavily involved in politics. Over the following decades, the Kennedy family produced multiple congressmen, an attorney general, and a United States president. In addition to having a long line of direct descendants, some individuals who married into the Kennedy family also contributed to its legacy. Take Ethel Kennedy, for example. Ethel married Robert Kennedy in 1950 and stood by him as he pursued his political aspirations. Unfortunately, within five years of her marriage, tragedy had struck her life in a number of different ways. Ethel Kennedy was born Ethel Skakel in Chicago, Illinois in 1928. Her father worked his way to the top of the railroad industry, resulting in the family becoming very wealthy. Due to her family's money, Ethel was afforded a life of relative luxury and eventually attended the Manhattanville College of the Sacred Heart. There, she would become friends with Jean Kennedy, who introduced her to her brother, Robert. The couple got married on June 17, 1950, and moved to Washington, D.C. when Robert Kennedy got a job with the Department of Justice. They started their family in 1951, while Robert was working alongside his brother, John F. Kennedy, on his political aspirations. While Ethel navigated motherhood, calamity befell her family in 1955 when both of her parents perished in a plane crash. Sadly, the untimely deaths of her parents wasn't the last loss she would suffer. Following the loss of her parents, Ethel and her husband purchased a mansion known as Hickory Hill in Virginia. Their home soon became the place to be, as the family hosted countless events and parties, with politicians, actors, and other celebrities in attendance. In addition to hosting these parties, Ethel became increasingly involved in politics, beginning in 1957 with her husband's appointment as chief counsel to the Senate Select Committee. She also joined the campaign trail for her brother-in-law as he made a run for the White House. John F. Kennedy was elected the 35th President of the United States in 1960. However, his historic tenure as the youngest president to ever be elected was cut short by an assassin's bullet on November 22, 1963. The death of JFK was not just a personal tragedy for Ethel, but for the nation as a whole. I will repeat with the greatest regret, two priests who were with President Kennedy say he has died of bullet wounds. Despite the horrors of JFK's assassination, the Kennedy family was determined to press on in the world of politics. This was particularly true for Ethel and Robert Kennedy. Following the death of his brother, Robert decided to run for a seat in the United States Senate, and his wife was right by his side. In 1968, after successfully winning a Senate seat, Robert decided to run for president. Ethel accompanied him on the campaign trail, despite being pregnant with the couple's 11th child. When he won the California Democratic primary, Robert should have been well on his way to winning the White House. Unfortunately, Robert was shot on June 5, 1968, and succumbed to his wounds the following day. Ethel would give birth to their last child, a daughter, just a few months later. A lot of wonderful children to be with. After the death of her husband, Ethel raised her family and began to make her own contributions to the public, carrying on her husband's legacy. One of her most notable accomplishments was founding the Robert F. Kennedy Memorial Center for Human Rights, which carries on her husband's work through journalism and human rights advocacy. Yet more misfortune struck Ethel's life when her son David died of a drug overdose in 1984. He had watched his father's assassination on TV and battled addiction afterward. In 1997, she lost another son, Michael, in a skiing accident. Ethel's pain would extend beyond her immediate family too as a number of other Kennedys have died in tragic circumstances over the years. In spite of all of the many losses that she suffered, Ethel Kennedy still fought for the causes that her husband championed. She has contributed greatly to the Kennedy family legacy and continues to serve as an inspiration. The Kennedy family's wealth and political power are legendary. Three U.S. Senators, two U.S. Ambassadors, and of course, President John F. Kennedy. But where did they get their money? Here's how the Kennedy family really got so rich. The source of those riches began with one man, Joseph Kennedy Sr. 
Kennedy's life and early business dealings have been the subject of several on-screen adaptations, including a story arc on HBO's Boardwalk Empire. Born in Boston in 1888, he faced discrimination from his working-class background and Irish Catholic identity. But he quickly made his name known. Graduating from Harvard in 1912, he entered a banking career and started donating to the Democratic Party, forming important political connections along the way. He married Rose Fitzgerald in 1914, a wise political move because her father John was none other than the mayor of Boston. But John resented the upstart Joseph marrying into a family better connected than the Kennedys were, so he sent Rose off to a European convent school for a year, apparently hoping distance would end the marriage. Not to be. Their marriage set off a lifetime of establishing important social connections for Joseph, though Rose would be left to play a compliant political wife, raising nine children and turning a blind eye to her husband's affairs. By the 1920s, Joseph Kennedy Sr. was an investor who wasn't all that concerned about the ethics of how he got his money. His part in the 1929 stock market crash is in that gray area between legitimate and illegitimate. As history reports, Kennedy was already known as a savvy investor by 1929. In that year, he saw his fellow investors taking part in what appeared to be a booming market. Though on looking closer he thought that they were pretty overvalued, he sold off some stocks and began shorting others, betting they would, very soon, be worth a lot less. He was right, and he made money when the stock market imploded in 1929, where others were bankrupted. Kennedy wasn't above insider trading either, according to Pittsburgh Quarterly, though it wasn't strictly illegal at the time. Still, he knew the window was closing, telling an associate, we better get in before they pass a law against it. According to Pittsburgh Quarterly, Joseph Kennedy Sr.'s first foray into the movie business came about in the 1920s, when Kennedy had purchased 31 movie theaters as part of a business group in the 1920s but couldn't get an in to buy a studio. Thanks to a connection he made with the Prince of Wales in Paris, however, he got a letter of introduction and eventually some heavyweight British banking money to become a studio boss. In Hollywood, he would later open his studio, FBO, with another to create Radio Keith Orpheum, eventually known as the big-name Hollywood studio RKO Pictures. By enacting more business deals and shuffling around shares, he came out of the whole venture with more than $15 million of today's money and profit, all in the span of only a few years. Some of that trading was based on insider information, but that wouldn't become illegal until the Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, decided it was, under the direction of Joseph as its first chairman. Rumors of Joseph Kennedy being a bootlegger were apparently just rumors, only springing up in the wake of President John F. Kennedy's assassination. Some wondered if mobsters may have been involved with the family since Prohibition. Chicago boss Sam Giancana told a friend that Joe Kennedy was one of the biggest crooks that ever lived. Though those types of allegations probably aren't true, Joseph did get in on the legitimate alcohol business before Prohibition finally collapsed, creating a new business called Somerset Importers and securing contracts on a trip to Britain to import a variety of liquors to the United States. I made the same deal, you know. Excuse me? Across the pond to import doors when the country returns to its senses. That happened thanks in part to his connections with Franklin Roosevelt. Due to some key political donations, and the business went into operation mere months before Prohibition went bust in 1933. On a momentous trip to Britain in 1933 to secure that business, Time reports that future Prime Minister Winston Churchill connected with Joseph. He got the liquor importing deal done thanks in part to his donation-funded connections to the Roosevelts, helping him become the first head of the SEC in 1934. Though some people expected Joseph to act like a crook after President Franklin D. Roosevelt named him SEC chairman, he surprised them and kept everything on the straight and narrow, deftly navigating a complicated political landscape full of both friends and enemies. Those were skills highly useful in the realm of diplomacy, too, and FDR would eventually name Joseph U.S. Ambassador to the United Kingdom from 1938 to 1940. Years later, Carolyn Kennedy, his granddaughter, would serve as U.S. Ambassador to Japan, 
from 2013 to 2017. Though Joseph Kennedy Sr. engaged in some political work himself, it seems pretty clear that his real political ambitions were reserved for his sons. And it all started with Harvard. Thanks in large part to their dad's efforts and the fact that he had already graduated from the university in 1912, the Kennedy children were pretty much guaranteed admission to Harvard themselves, says The Crimson. Joseph Jr. got his degree in 1938, followed by his younger brothers John, Robert, and Ted in succession. Meanwhile, Joe Sr. had been making significant donations to political groups to help pave the way for his kids to get involved in politics eventually. According to Pittsburgh Quarterly, he backed FDR with a pretty significant $25,000 donation back when Roosevelt was still just the governor of New York. That was followed up by even bigger donations and fundraising for FDR's Democratic Party over the years, presumably making it all the easier for a Kennedy to get a warm reception by party members. The Kennedy son who had been Joe's focus for a political career was Joseph Kennedy Jr. But he died in a top-secret mission for the U.S. military in August of 1944, when an explosive aboard his plane detonated unexpectedly and killed both him and his co-pilot. With Joseph Jr.'s death, reports Pittsburgh Quarterly, the next eldest son, John, became the focus of Joseph Sr.'s political ambitions. It was a focus that apparently helped a young John F. Kennedy make extra friends, PBS says. John's friends knew that, though he was loaded, he never carried money. So whenever they spent time together, the friends could pay the tab and then be promptly reimbursed by Joseph Sr. With this helpful backing, JFK capitalized on political connections opened by his dad, entering national politics with his 1947 election to the House of Representatives. In 1953, JFK married Jacqueline Bouvier from an old money family. The New Yorker reports that the match opened the Kennedy clan up to additional circles of power. By then, the Kennedys' wealth and political connections reinforced each other, arguably helping JFK secure a senator's seat and, in 1960, the White House. This opened the way for more important political connections, not to mention some serious donations for election campaigns. Even JFK's popular books may have been boosted by not only his family's name, but by sales financed through the Kennedy Millions. Along the way, the connections and large campaign donations kept pouring in, expanding the Kennedy web of wealth and power. That sort of easily accessible wealth later made it all the easier for JFK to donate his $100,000 presidential salary to charity, certainly helping the optics of his time in the White House. With investments and business deals in a wide variety of different ventures, from liquor imports to Hollywood film studios, Joe Sr. launched a winning strategy of diversification that paid off with monetary and political returns. And like so many investors before and after him, the father of the Kennedy clan put a decent amount of his money into real estate too. As the book The Patriarch tells it, by the first couple of decades of the 20th century, Kennedy was already deep into the Boston real estate market, which of course earned his family a large income. Real estate continues to be a significant part of the modern Kennedy fortune. As PBS reports, the land and homes owned currently by the Kennedys are high-end. There are famous family compounds in upscale locations like Cape Cod and Palm Beach, as well as more commercial properties like Miami's Hialeah Racetrack that pay into Kennedy coffers. According to Forbes, the Kennedy family also has a stake in Vornado Realty, which gives them millions through an investment deal with the company via incorporated entities and trusts. As of 2014, it was estimated that the family had earned $170 million from this deal alone since 1998. With a pretty hefty amount of money rolling in, the Kennedys have strong reasons to get laser-focused on what happens when their money crosses paths with the IRS. And like other ultra-wealthy people who can afford to hire exclusive tax advisors, they've learned how to take advantage of some seriously lucrative tax exemptions. Specifically, much of the Kennedy fortune has avoided run-ins with the capital gains tax. The capital gains tax, as explained by Investopedia, is essentially a tax levied against investments. When a person or corporation sells an investment, any growth between when the investment was taken on and when it's sold is subject to that tax. So with a lot of investments that could grow quite a bit over time, 
the capital gains tax can make you feel pretty anxious. Except, as Forbes reports, the Kennedy family appears to have deferred and maybe even completely avoided the capital gains tax for many of their investments, due to significant loopholes in the rule. At this point, the Kennedy family is now one of the most recognizable names in America with a fortune to match. It's also grown beyond the enterprising Joseph Kennedy Sr., with far more family members who might have access to those funds without the oversight of the family patriarch who originally brought it all together. So, how is a fortune supposed to sustain itself in the face of, say, a wayward family member who is an absolute dud when it comes to money management? No one's thrown out any names of actual Kennedys here, but in case anyone ever tries spending the fortune recklessly, the Kennedy money is probably safe. That's because, according to Forbes, a large amount of the family fortune is tucked away in a series of trusts, some of which are managed in Kennedy Sr.'s name. Joseph P. Kennedy Enterprises ties many of these disparate funds together, and those funds can contain anywhere from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars. Yet, while a Kennedy or two might be on the board of the organization, much of the actual work of handling investments falls to outside advisors and money managers. For the Kennedys who collect the money at the end of the day, that's probably just fine by them. If you're trying to dig into the nitty-gritty of the modern-day Kennedy riches, you might run into quite a few walls over the course of your quest. According to Forbes, much of the Kennedy family's holdings are now in private securities, meaning that public information about them is pretty tough to come by. Family member Christopher Kennedy said that, We are a very public family with a very private investment philosophy. There are some glimpses into the exact state of the fortune, though. As Newsweek reports, Kennedys serving in Congress have had to list their income, just like other senators and representatives. However, also like their fellow politicians, they have been allowed to do so in very broad, difficult-to-track brackets that allow them to hide at least part of their full wealth. Ted Kennedy, the youngest of JFK's siblings, earned a $165,200 yearly salary as a senator, though. Thanks to the income from the Kennedy's vast network of investments, he likely could have foregone that income entirely and hardly noticed. Just look at the numbers. On Joseph Kennedy Sr.'s death in 1969, he left about $400 million, or $2.67 billion in 2018 money, to his family, setting them up for a good long while. Rose Schlossberg seems more at home in the end times than the halls of power. Still, she can't hide the family resemblance that proves she's part of a political dynasty. Rose Schlossberg is the daughter of designer Edwin Schlossberg and Caroline Kennedy, the only surviving child of former U.S. President John F. Kennedy. But despite her famous family, she prefers to keep a low profile. The young Kennedy perhaps gets the most attention for being the spitting image of her grandmother, Jacqueline Kennedy, the former First Lady, Emmy winner, and fashion icon. A schoolteacher of Rose's once told Kennedy biographer C. David Heyman, referring to Jackie's maiden name, Bouvier, she tried not to draw attention to herself, which was quite a task considering her family name. Rose looked like Jackie, though not as refined. She has the dark, good looks of a Bouvier and the sensibility of a Kennedy. Dubbed Jackie 2.0 for her hazelnut eyes, brunette hair, and signature red lips, there's a lot more to Rose than her striking resemblance to her stylish grandmother. IMDb notes that Rose was born on June 25, 1988, in New York. According to Pop Sugar, Jacqueline named Rose after JFK's mother. That's a bit surprising, given that Jacqueline and Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy apparently had a tumultuous relationship. Heyman quoted an unidentified confidant of the former First Lady as saying, Kennedy women were treated like second-class citizens, and Jackie refused to play second fiddle. My husband loves a challenge, and uh, I do too." Jacqueline made efforts to spend plenty of time with her granddaughter until she died of cancer at age 64 in 1994. They would go to Central Park, museums, and on school field trips together. According to Kennedy biographer Christopher Anderson, Jackie, who lived just a few blocks away from the Schlossbergs on the Upper East Side, saw Rose basically every day and doted on her. Jackie knew it was important to sow the seeds of good behavior early on, and she tried to do that in the final years of her life. It was a mission for her. 
According to the New York Post, after attending a private all-girls school in New York City, Rose went to Harvard University to pursue a bachelor's degree in English studies. She took film courses and, like Jacqueline, cultivated an interest in fashion. In 2013, she earned her Master of Professional Studies from New York University. Three years later, Rose co-created the web series End Times Girls Club. She also starred in the comedy series, which explored life after the apocalypse. Rose told Mashable, It came up as a response to seeing the way that New York responded to Hurricane Sandy and how people were grossly underprepared, specifically girls in damsel in distress mode. I thought it would be interesting to create this world where girls have to be survivalists without compromising their cute factor. There are real benefits looking good at a uh, post doomsday. For example, you will want people to invite you into their bunker. Rose's IMDb page notes that she has also acted in the films Houses and Small Gay Tragedy No. 1, and produced a six-episode docuseries, Time, The Khalif Browder Story. While Rose's mom, Caroline, represents the Kennedys in political circles now, Kennedy family historian Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr. was quoted by the New York Post as saying, Rose is the leader of the pack. Her opinion counts. She is highly regarded within the ever-expanding circle. In many respects, she is the face and future of the clan. Rose hasn't publicly shown that she has any political aspirations, but she's well aware of the family business. She supported Barack Obama in his 2008 presidential campaign, Vogue notes. New York Magazine reported that she also reportedly advised her mother to drop out of the 2008 New York Senate race. She also volunteered for Democrat Alan Casey's campaign for Massachusetts Senate in 2010, according to Irish Central. Rose has also inherited the perks of being a Kennedy. In 2021, Page Six snapped some photos of Rose and her brother Jack enjoying the vast family property in Martha's Vineyard, Redgate Farm. The property was a retreat for Jacqueline Kennedy, who bought the 340 acres of undeveloped land in 1979, according to Christie's Real Estate. The homes on the luxurious property are surrounded by a nature preserve and include a mile of Atlantic coastline. It also boasted a fairy treehouse for the former First Lady's grandchildren. The Providence Journal reported that the family sold all but 95 acres of the land in 2020 to two nonprofit land conservation organizations that plan to open it to the public. Thousands of secret documents, a deathbed confession, the ongoing secrecy around President John F. Kennedy's assassination files have fueled conspiracy theories, but what's really going on? Despite Congress announcing that documents related to the terrible events of November 1963 should be released, the White House has repeatedly stalled. Bizarre things surrounding JFK's assassination have been intensely debated by both the public and the press. Some of the most popular theories include the widespread belief that Lee Harvey Oswald didn't act alone. Conspiracy theorists of all stripes often argue that a man spotted nearby with an umbrella may have been involved, as well as the Russians, the mob, the CIA, President Lyndon B. Johnson, or even Ted Cruz's dad. Congress first agreed that the files should be made public in 1992, and although a great deal of information has been brought to light, 16,000 files related to the mysterious plot have never been released. In theory, one day the digitized documents will be available online for all to see. The United States government has the right to keep the JFK documents secret if releasing them will compromise security in some way. This is due to a clause in the John F. Kennedy Assassination Records Collection Act passed in 1992. The act stipulated that the documents should be released by 2017, 25 years later. President Donald Trump made moves to honor that promise when he was in office. However, he later announced that some files would remain secret. The president issued a memo saying there is potentially irreversible harm to national security if all the records are released. Trump's administration okayed the release of 19,045 files, but a majority of the documents still had key names and details redacted, according to The Washington Post. According to a report released by Politico, CIA and FBI officials have been embroiled in a multi-year-long conflict over the release of the documents in an attempt to keep them secret. Some of those fighting for secrecy have stated that they wish to protect the safety and privacy of still-living agents and informants. Most of the files are under the lock and key of the CIA, but 23% are controlled by the FBI. Some conspiracy theorists are still convinced that the files contain evidence that the CIA was involved in Kennedy's death. As recently as 2007, an extremely ill ex-CIA agent, E. Howard Hunt, personally named a handful of CIA operatives, as well as Lyndon B. Johnson, as the true culprits behind the assassination. The notorious agent Hunt went to prison for his role in the Watergate scandal in the 1970s. The Mary Farrell Foundation, who are pushing for the release of the documents, have claimed that critical information related to the JFK murder was illegally redacted from E. Howard Hunt's files when the last round of documents were published. 
There is also some speculation that the documents will reveal an embarrassingly close relationship between Lee Harvey Oswald and the CIA. Some of the already declassified JFK files have shown that the CIA was surveilling Oswald's activities in Mexico just weeks before he killed the president. So is this the man you believe killed President Kennedy? I think we have the right man. Speaking on behalf of the Mary Farrell Foundation, Jefferson Morley, an ex-Washington Post journalist, has repeatedly argued that the CIA worked with Oswald in the 1960s. Among the unreleased files, journalists are particularly keen to get a hold of records regarding the career of Agent George Joannidis, who worked at the CIA's Miami offices and infiltrated an anti-Fidel Castro group in the 60s. The Mary Farrell Foundation believes that Lee Harvey Oswald was known to Joannidis. The now-deceased ex-agent was awarded an intelligence medal for unknown reasons in the 1980s. After President Joe Biden's election, the issue of the hidden documents came up again. In 2021, 1,500 new files were published by the National Archives. Skeptics will be unsurprised to discover that they revealed nothing shocking in relation to the case, although they did show that Lee Harvey Oswald was attempting to get a visa to enter the Soviet Union just prior to the assassination. In 2021, Biden issued a memo to further delay the release of most of the materials once again. In response, the Mary Farrell Foundation began a lawsuit against Biden and the National Archives this October. Why are they suing? Because they don't trust the CIA, the government, or the White House in this case. On December 15, 2022, the National Archives released more than 13,000 additional documents connected to the assassination. The newly released documents are available online. The Kennedys are the most famous family in U.S. political history, so maybe it's no surprise they've got a few supposed skeletons in their closets. Rumors about the bootlegging past of Joseph P. Kennedy, the patriarch of the Kennedy clan, have been around since at least the 1960s, but the truth is more than a little murky. One thing we know for certain is that Joe Kennedy profited from the sale of alcohol just after the end of Prohibition. Whether or not he was involved in bootlegging before that, however, is unknown. Using his ties to the UK, Kennedy imported whiskey and gin from Great Britain and made a tidy sum on the back of America's renewed thirst for liquor. Rumors about his supposed bootlegging prior to this emerged partly thanks to Kennedy's Harvard reunion in 1922, during which witnesses claim he helped to supply the alcohol. This may have been a singular incident, but there are also many other rumors suggesting that Kennedy used his mob connections to get into the game when booze was banned. Crime boss Frank Costello, for example, is one of several men who claimed Kennedy got rich selling liquor during prohibition. Kennedy's mysterious rise to great wealth has only made the story that much more compelling. Joseph Kennedy made a number of anti-Semitic remarks throughout his prestigious career as U.S. ambassador. He also embarrassed the country by expressing sympathy for fascists in Europe. Rightly or wrongly, many people today remember Kennedy as both a Nazi sympathizer and an all-around awful person. Stories about Kennedy's Nazi sympathies arose partly due to his enthusiasm for appeasement. He believed that Great Britain could never beat Hitler and advised Franklin D. Roosevelt to stay out of the matter. Roosevelt subsequently began talking to Winston Churchill without the involvement of Kennedy. After Japan attacked the U.S., Kennedy became officially toxic and Roosevelt passed him over completely when it came to awarding war offices. Kennedy was not merely short-sighted, however. He had also expressed his genuine admiration for Hitler, often at times that now seem wildly inappropriate. For example, he publicly praised Hitler's supposed military prowess to a graduating class at the University of Notre Dame. On another occasion, he tried to halt the production of a Hollywood film on the grounds that it might defend Hitler and Benito Mussolini. But worst of all were his anti-Semitic remarks. Declassified documents from the German Foreign Ministry show that Kennedy expressed his sympathy for Germany's Jewish problem and complained that Americans had been unduly influenced by Jewish opinions. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. One accusation against Joseph P. Kennedy comes from none other than the iconic Hollywood star Gloria Swanson. During Kennedy's brief foray into the film industry, he developed a romantic relationship with Swanson. Eventually, their affair ended, and their parting wasn't exactly amicable. Kennedy had come to Hollywood to invest his fortune, hoping to make large profits out of the rapidly growing industry. While there, he met Swanson, who was already in some financial trouble due to her lavish lifestyle, so she was only too happy to let Kennedy help her out. 
Together, the pair developed a business relationship and attempted to make a movie together, an endeavor that proved to be a total failure. A consummate hustler, Kennedy bought Swanson a series of fabulous presents while they were together, including a house. However, it transpired that Kennedy's gifts weren't gifts at all. He had billed all these presents to Gloria Productions, leaving a shell-shocked Swanson with millions in debt. Swanson alleged in her autobiography that Kennedy made a cool $5 million during his time working with her in Hollywood while she was left bankrupt and brokenhearted. Despite the best efforts of her lawyers and accountants, she never got her money back. Perhaps to satisfy those who never understood how Jacqueline Kennedy could stand to stay with her adulterous husband, a rumor was once printed that claimed she had actually been paid to stay in the family. The story appeared after it was noted that the young couple spent a great deal of time apart. Supposedly, both her husband's cheating and her own political aspirations had caused a great deal of resentment between the two. The rumor ran that Joseph Kennedy, thinking of his son's future political career, offered Jackie $1 million to stay, and she accepted. While there is no way of knowing if the story is true, Jackie responded with characteristic grace. When the original claims were printed in Time magazine, Jackie reportedly quipped to Joseph, why not 10 million? Either way, the couple stayed together and JFK made his bid for the presidency in 1960 with his wife by his side and a few other women as well. President John F. Kennedy is rumored to have had many extramarital affairs during his time in the Oval Office, but his supposed tryst with intern Mimi Alford remains by far the most controversial of the lot. Although Alford herself has claimed her sexual encounters with the president were consensual, the nature of the relationship and the uncomfortable power dynamic between the two continues to raise eyebrows. On her fourth day working at the White House, the 19-year-old intern was plied with alcohol and wound up having sex with the president in an empty room. It was the start of an affair that would go on for many months. I was just, in a way, swept away with it. Aside from the age gap between the then 45-year-old president and his teen employee, some of the stories Alfred told about the affair range from shocking to downright creepy. At one point in her memoir, Once Upon a Secret, Alfred recounted that she performed a sex act on presidential aide Dave Powers in front of JFK. Elsewhere, Alfred mentions taking drugs with the president and also describes his request that she take care of Ted Kennedy a request she refused to carry out. Aspects of Alfred's allegations have been confirmed by relevant witnesses who also worked at the White House. Alfred received her share of condemnation when the story went public, as she had been engaged when she had the affair, but she has also received sympathy for her vulnerable position and young age at the time. Probably the wildest accusation about the Kennedy family is the rumor that they assassinated Marilyn Monroe. The actress was found dead on her bed next to a bottle of sleeping pills in 1962, and although her death was officially ruled a suicide, countless rumors made the rounds in the years that followed. Monroe was said to have had an affair with John F. Kennedy. However, if the rumor mill is to be believed, it was Robert whom she truly loved. Many of Monroe's friends claim she was heavily preoccupied with the married attorney general in the days leading up to her death. I think you're the saddest girl I ever met. You're the first man I ever said that. I'm usually told how happy I am. On the day she died, Monroe phoned friend and hairdresser Sidney Gilleroff to complain that Robert Kennedy had shown up at her house to yell at her. He also called off their secret relationship. Monroe apparently responded by threatening to expose the tryst to the public, and before hanging up, she told Gilleroff she was privy to secrets from the highest rungs of government. The close relationship between the Kennedy brothers and Monroe, as well as the fact that the FBI kept a file on the star, inevitably led to rumors of murder. In 1964, author Frank A. Capel wrote a bizarre pamphlet entitled The Strange Death of Marilyn Monroe, in which he alleged that Monroe was assassinated as part of an elaborate conspiracy. Other early rumors stemmed from Norman Mailer, who did not believe his own story but thought it would make him money. He was right in a way, though. True or not, this tale is still popular today. Did John F. Kennedy's considerable charisma win him the presidency, or was it his secret mob connections? There are various iterations of this theory, but the basic gist is this. The Kennedys had some form of cozy relationship with Chicago mob boss Sam Giancana, so Joseph Kennedy approached the gangster to ask for help getting his son elected. The Giancana clan agreed, promising to intimidate voters in exchange for tacit support from a Kennedy administration. In some versions of this story, Robert and John F. Kennedy were then assassinated 
assassinated by the mob in retaliation for not holding up their end of the bargain. As Attorney General, Robert Kennedy was actually pretty tough on organized crime. The source material upon which these rumors are based is certainly interesting. One version of this story appears in a book written by members of the Giancana family, while another comes from a former FBI agent. However, there has been no corroborating evidence of voter intimidation from the time. Still, the rumors persist, and the involvement of mob figures in JFK's assassination only added more fuel to the conspiracy fire. Both Lee Harvey Oswald and the man who shot him, Jack Ruby, seem to have had tenuous mob connections of some kind, connections that have been linked to a wider conspiracy involving a mob-orchestrated revenge hit. In July 1969, political hopeful Ted Kennedy drove his car off a bridge, crashing into a pond on Chappaquiddick Island. His passenger, a young woman named Mary Jo Kopechny, drowned that night. The incident hindered Kennedy's fledgling political career. He was also handed a two-month prison sentence for leaving the scene of the accident, although he never spent any actual time incarcerated. Kennedy had acted quite strangely following the crash. He awaited until 10 a.m. the next day to tell the police, and only spoke to them after his car had already been found. When Kennedy retold the story later on, he claimed he had driven back to the crash site that night with one of his political aides and his cousin in an attempt to rescue the young woman. However, Kennedy's nonchalant behavior upon returning to his hotel, along with the fact that he was seen apparently bone-dry in the lobby at 2.25 a.m., posed further questions about his story. My conduct and conversations during the next several hours, to the extent that I can remember them, make no sense to me at all. Some suspected Kennedy of drunk driving, but it was far too late to administer a sobriety test by the time this suggestion was raised. Others suspected an illicit affair of some kind. Kopechny had worked on Robert Kennedy's political campaign and had been at a party with the family that night, although it was not clear why she would have been out so late with Ted Kennedy. He claimed Kopechny had been taken ill, but had curiously left her purse and keys behind at the event. To this day, many people remain skeptical about Kennedy's version of events. In 1991, a lesser-known Kennedy, William Kennedy Smith, the nephew of JFK, was accused of raping a woman at the Kennedy family compound in Palm Beach, Florida. Smith had been out on the town on the night of March 30th, accompanied by two other Kennedys, when he arrived home with a 29-year-old woman in tow. Within the next 24 hours, the alleged victim was admitted to the hospital with a suspected rib fracture, as well as some minor abrasions and bruises. The woman, who later publicly identified herself as Patricia Bowman, claimed that she had sustained the injuries when Smith tackled her at the family home. He subsequently held her down and raped her. During the ensuing investigation, Bowman also claimed that private investigators hired by Smith had been sent to intimidate her. When the story hit the press, it caused a sensation, especially after three more women came forward to make rape accusations against Smith. Despite the uproar, the case ultimately went nowhere. Smith argued that the sex had been consensual and was acquitted of all charges. It was not the last time he was accused of sexual assault, however. Smith's assistant made a similar claim against him in 2004, alleging that she was raped in his Chicago apartment in 1999. The case was thrown out by the judge and never went to trial. Nothing quite says sibling rivalry like sleeping with your presidential brother-in-law. Just ask Jackie Kennedy and her sister-slash-enemy, Princess Lee Radziwill. The relationship between Jackie Kennedy and Lee Radziwill had a lot of ups and downs over the years, to say the least. They started out as the Bouvier sisters, the daughters of Janet Lee Bouvier and Jack Vernou Bouvier. Jackie was born on July 28, 1929, making her the elder of the two sisters. Lee, born Caroline Lee, followed four years later on March 3, 1933. The sisters lived a life of luxury, spending their early days living in the family's Manhattan apartment or relaxing at their family's estate on Long Island. While the Bouviers seemed to be quite wealthy, Jack Bouvier had endured some financial losses during the stock market crash of 1929. Jack and Janet's marriage started to disintegrate under the strain. The pair separated in 1936 and finalized their divorce in 1940. Some of the tension between Jackie and Lee may have started early on. Lee believed their father favored Jackie, and only felt worse as Jackie so excelled at school. Jackie, meanwhile, felt that their mother preferred Lee over her. Eventually, the girl's mother remarried, tying the knot with Hugh D. Auchincloss, a successful investment banker. The Bouvier sisters then spent time at Auchincloss's mansion in Virginia and summered in Newport, Rhode Island, where he had a large estate called Hammersmith Farm. Both sisters attended the elite Miss Porter's school in Connecticut, but they took very different paths after graduation. I always hated school, but I really hated Miss Porter. 
Jackie, the more academically accomplished of the two, attended Vassar College for her first two years of school. She then went to Paris to study at the Sorbonne for her junior year. When Lee graduated high school, she went to Paris with Jackie. The two spent the summer of 1951 traipsing around Europe. Through their family's numerous connections, the sisters received introductions to diplomats and other members of high society. This journey together may have been the closest the two would ever be in their adult lives, and before long, their sibling rivalry resurfaced. Jackie went to Washington, D.C. after Paris, and Lee tried college life for three semesters before dropping out of Sarah Lawrence. Jackie finished her degree at George Washington University in 1951 and worked for the Washington Times Herald, while Lee put her savvy fashion sense to work as an assistant to Diana Freeland of Harper's Bazaar. In 1953, Lee married Michael Canfield, the adopted son of the publisher of Harper and Row. Two months after Lee's wedding, however, Jackie stole the spotlight with news of her own engagement to none other than John F. Kennedy. Jack was the most unselfconscious person I've ever seen. Jackie married Kennedy in September 1953. They quickly became a Washington power couple as her husband's fortunes rose in the Democratic Party. At the same time, Lee's marriage began to fizzle out, and she and Canfield soon separated. In the aftermath, Lee married Stanislaw Radziwill, an exiled Polish prince. Despite whatever social cachet she thought she achieved with her marriage, Lee was soon eclipsed once more by her older sister, whose husband had become President of the United States. Lee and her husband visited the White House on several occasions as guests of the Kennedys, and she even helped Jackie develop her iconic style. Lee often traveled with Jackie, and she notably accompanied Jackie on her official visit to India and Pakistan in 1962. But not everything was rosy between the two sisters. During her second marriage, Lee engaged in several extramarital affairs, and one of her alleged paramours was her own brother-in-law, John F. Kennedy. Lee reportedly told other people about her tryst with Kennedy, and this news may have gotten back to Jackie. President Kennedy wasn't the only man the sisters may have clashed over, either. Lee also got involved with Greek shipping magnate Aristotle Onassis, and she was quite taken with him. Lee later asked Onassis to invite Jackie on his yacht so that she could recuperate after the death of her son Patrick, who had died barely more than a day after he was born in 1963. After the assassination of her husband, Jackie found solace with Onassis again, and a relationship eventually developed between the two. The pair wed in 1968, which couldn't have helped with the tension between Jackie and Lee. But some sources indicate that Lee actually supported Jackie's relationship relationship with Onassis. The financial rift between Jackie and Lee widened after Onassis' death in 1975. Jackie received $20 million from his considerable estate, plus an additional $6 million to cover related taxes, although the couple had been in divorce proceedings at the time of his death. Jackie managed to parlay that money into a $150 million fortune. Perhaps the most revealing insight about the rift between Jackie and Lee surfaced after Jackie's death in 1994. In her will, Jackie left Lee absolutely nothing. Jackie gave Lee's two children $500,000 each, but she intentionally excluded her sister. Jackie knew that Lee had struggled financially over the years, and she explicitly stated in her will that she had omitted her sister on purpose because she had provided for her during her lifetime. Jackie's will marked the final act in a deeply complicated sisterly relationship, one that was defined as much by animosity as it was by love. Without memory, there's no life. And, um... That's the way I'd feel. Did a broken ankle from a hang gliding accident ultimately result in John F. Kennedy Jr.'s tragic death in a plane crash? Here's what really happened before the accident. John F. Kennedy Jr. spent his life in the pages of magazines. But when Kennedy got into the game himself with George Magazine in 1995, it wasn't as a model or a subject, but as an editor. George was a glossy magazine dedicated to marrying political and celebrity coverage. Kennedy suggested in the inaugural issue that George was part of a shift in the way politicians spoke to voters. Some critics, including a particularly acidic reviewer in Spy Magazine, suggested the whole enterprise was designed to make Kennedy look smart and shut up those members of the press who looked down on him. According to anonymous staffers interviewed by Spy, morale was initially high and Kennedy was well thought of by his team. When it finally debuted, George reached a circulation number north of 400,000, but its early success wasn't maintained. Critics pounced, sharing rumors of incompetence and tensions behind the scene. But ultimately, this magazine is going to stand or fall on whether or not it's a good magazine. According to Edward Klein's 2003 book, The Kennedy Curse, Why Tragedy Has Haunted America's First Family for 150 Years, George was projected to lose $10 million in 1999. Determined to keep it afloat, Kennedy sought to move the magazine to a new publisher, but died before those plans came to fruition. The magazine ultimately folded in 2001, 
18 months after Kennedy's death. Kennedy had several high-profile relationships before settling down with rumored partners including Madonna and Sarah Jessica Parker. But in September 1996, Kennedy married fashion publicist Carolyn Bassett, whom he had been involved with for some time. The photogenic couple were a strong draw for the media. Yet, despite her background in publicity, Bassett came into her marriage unprepared for the degree of scrutiny the Kennedy family was subject to. According to Edward Klein's The Kennedy Curse, press intrusion into the marriage began almost the moment they came back from their honeymoon. His reaction to the press, however, was very different from Bassett's. Klein suggests that Kennedy loved the attention, while Bassett increasingly sought ways to run from it. Former assistant to Jackie Kennedy, Kathy McCown, claimed in her book Jackie's Girl that Bassett wanted to lash out at the paparazzi. In their final months, Kennedy's magazine George was purportedly exacerbating tensions between the couple. Bassett resented the demands the magazine put on her husband's time. The hectic and heavily scrutinized nature of their lives also put her off having children, another point of conflict with Kennedy. Tensions were mounting in the final months of Kennedy and Carolyn's lives. Edward Klein painted a grim picture in The Kennedy Curse. Citing an anonymous friend, Klein wrote that Kennedy and Bassett were barely on speaking terms and that Kennedy was talking divorce just two days before his plane crash. Bassett was alleged to be terrified at the thought of losing Kennedy, having been through divorce as a child, but was also controlling and antagonistic toward anyone else who commanded her husband's attention, even his sister. Other nameless sources suggested that Bassett used cocaine and got physically violent with Kennedy, but this portrait of the couple's married life in their last days has been disputed by other friends some of whom who were willing to actually go on the record. Ariel Paredes, the granddaughter of an assistant to Jackie Kennedy, conceded to people that Kennedy and Bassett often argued, but maintained that they were a loving couple. John Perry Barlow, a friend of Kennedy's, also disputed the unflattering media portrayal of Bassett, while another anonymous friend insisted that any tensions between the pair at the time of their deaths would have passed over. The death of John F. Kennedy Jr. came on the heels of a series of misfortunes for the family, leading to a rift among the Kennedys. JFK Jr. had used his editorial in George Magazine to denounce the behavior of his cousins, Michael Kennedy and U.S. Representative Joseph Kennedy, after Joseph tried to have a previous marriage annulled and Michael was caught having an inappropriate relationship with his underage babysitter. Things seemed to only be patched up after Michael's untimely death in a skiing accident on New Year's Eve 1997. John Jr. attended and participated in the service and was seen embracing Joseph. The Kennedys are sometimes referred to as American royalty, but John F. Kennedy's cousin and best friend Tony was literally royalty. The son of Kennedy's aunt, Princess Lee Radziwill, Anthony Radziwill, made his living in media, working his way from an associate sports producer with NBC in 1988 to an Emmy award-winning news producer with ABC by 1990, with his work well-regarded by journalists like Diane Sawyer. He and Kennedy were each other's best men at their respective weddings. But in 1994, the same year he married his wife Carol, Radziwill was diagnosed with testicular cancer. By 1999, the 40-year-old Radziwill, his wife, and his cousin Kennedy knew that he wasn't going to make it. So sure was Radziwill's impending death that Kennedy was working on a eulogy for him right before his own death. Kennedy's wife, Carolyn Bassett, was also close to the Radziwills and did her best to see to their needs. On August 10, 1999, less than a month after Kennedy's tragic plane crash, Anthony Radziwill died. Besides his name and good looks, Kennedy Jr.'s public persona was defined by his love of adventure. He liked to bike, rollerblade, scuba dive, kayak, drive a powered parachute, glide, and fly. Friends and instructors remembered him as loving the freedom of such endeavors while still taking care and pursuing them. But an accident from one of his adventures has become tied in with theories about his tragic death. Six weeks prior to his last flight, Kennedy was hang gliding when he broke his ankle. He was put in a cast and had to get around on crutches. He still wasn't fully healed when he had his cast removed on July 15, 1999, but Kennedy was delighted. He told his friends that he was most happy because having the cast off meant he could fly planes on his own. It was an enthusiasm not shared by his friends or doctors, who all counseled Kennedy to wait until he was more fully healed. Some of that worry came from Kennedy's inexperience as a pilot. According to the podcast Fatal Voyage, The Death of JFK Jr., while he was licensed to fly by 1999, he was still unskilled in monitoring instruments. On top of that, he would need to foot operate his plane's pedals. It's been speculated that Kennedy's injury and inexperience both contributed to his fatal plane crash, though a fellow pilot disputed that theory based on Kennedy's movement before the flight. 
At the time of his last flight, John F. Kennedy Jr. was a licensed private pilot, but he had only held that license since April of the previous year, and his credentials were not complete in July 1999. He was not yet qualified to fly solely by instruments. According to historian John Hankey on the Fatal Voyage podcast, Kennedy was in the process of getting an instrument rating before his death, having passed the relevant exams. His flight instructor, Lloyd Howard, said, I think it gave him freedom. Freedom from press, freedom from pictures, freedom from people wanting autographs. But air crash investigator Richard Bender told Fatal Voyage that Kennedy still wasn't solid enough on the instruments to always know which one to look at, and his 37 logged flight hours in his private plane weren't enough to qualify for personal liability insurance, a fact that, according to Edward Klein's The Kennedy Curse, Kennedy kept even from his own wife. Kennedy wasn't intimidated by his limited experience. Editor Barry Levine told Fatal Voyage that flying was Kennedy's great passion and release from cares. He got into flying every weekend with his dog Friday, and he enjoyed flying his planes without a co-pilot. Kennedy was quick to tell friends after getting the ankle cast off on July 15th that he could now fly solo. A delay in getting the cast off might have required that he enlisted a co-pilot for the trip up to Martha's Vineyard. Some also think that Kennedy, underqualified in reading instruments, wasn't capable of landing his plane safely when it ran into haze. The Kennedy name is inextricably linked to politics in American life, but John F. Kennedy Jr. did not go into the family business other than through the magazine George. In the final months of his life, though, the political itch seemed to have reached him. According to biographer Stephen M. Gillen, though Kennedy was keen to find his own identity and felt no compunction to become a politician, he still began exploring a run for the U.S. Senate in March 1999. New York was about to have an open seat, but the precarious state of George magazine, the poor health of his cousin Anthony Radziwill, and tensions within the family all discouraged him. And though his father had served in the Senate, Kennedy was not attracted to the legislative branch, said Gillen. He was interested in perhaps running for New York governor down the road. We all know that politics is a tough profession these days, but um, I think a very rewarding one. And after that, perhaps 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Gillen has claimed that Kennedy, upon seeing George H.W. Bush's inauguration with an unnamed friend, talked about going home, as in the White House, where Kennedy had grown up as a child. If a presidential run wasn't immediately in the cards, it might have factored into Kennedy's long-term planning. While John F. Kennedy Jr. was regularly in the spotlight, his older sister Caroline was a much quieter presence in American life. Never one to court the press or attract them in the way her other family members did, Caroline worked with the American Ballet Theater and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and though she would later become a U.S. ambassador, she mostly avoided politics in her younger years. Her social circle included the Clintons and Hollywood stars, and she was, for a time, close to her brother. Edward Klein speculated in The Kennedy Curse that John Jr. took after the Bouvier family more in looks, but the Kennedys in temperament, outgoing and daring, while the reverse was true with Caroline. As they entered adulthood, tensions started to develop between these siblings of such different attitudes. Caroline reportedly didn't think much of George Magazine, which John Jr. took personally, and neither of them liked the other's spouse. According to Stephen M. Gillen's biography, America's Reluctant Prince, Caroline's husband, Ed Schlossberg, inserted himself into Kennedy family decisions in a way that irked John Jr. And Caroline allegedly got off on the wrong foot with John Jr.'s wife, Carolyn, on their wedding day. In their final months, John Jr. and Bassett barely spoke with Caroline. Such family tension was hard, and John Jr. and Caroline had tentatively begun to mend fences, but both counted on having more time to do so. On July 16, 1999, John F. Kennedy Jr. took to the air to attend the wedding of his cousin, Rory. There was a question in the days immediately before the flight whether John Jr.'s wife, Carolyn, would attend as well. Husband and wife were alleged not to be on speaking terms, and according to Edward Klein's The Kennedy Curse, Carolyn was also reluctant to go anywhere near John Jr.'s flying hobby. Klein wrote that Carolyn's sister, Lauren, persuaded her sister to join her husband at the wedding and join the flight party herself. The plan was for Lauren to get dropped off at Martha's Vineyard. John Jr. and Carolyn would then fly to Hyannisport, to the Kennedy compound, for the wedding. The flight was late in getting off the ground, and it was contrary to other flights out of New Jersey that night, which were called off on account of poor visibility. John Jr.'s plane never arrived in Martha's Vineyard. Tragically, it crashed into the sea, killing all three on board. The accident was later ruled to be due to pilot error, leading to an outpouring of grief from around the globe. I want to express our family support and offer our prayers and those of all Americans 